This is, as we, if you were not here last week, this is the second Sunday in Advent, and we always, or the assumption is that most of the people who spend time in church know Luke chapter 2 pretty well. Maggie just read a little bit from it. In those days, a decree was issued from Caesar Augustus and on and on. We know chapter 2, but there's a whole chapter of Luke that happens before that one. And Luke put it there for a reason. Like that, that was important to the author of the material, so maybe we should pay a little bit of attention to it as well. So that's what we're doing for the four Sundays of Advent, is taking Luke chapter 1 in pieces and taking a look at those. So last, month we, last week we heard about Zechariah and Elizabeth, that John the Baptist would be born, that Elizabeth, who was called unable to give birth, would be pregnant, and now she is. She's six months pregnant, and this is Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. Again, if you're raised in the church... You've heard this one before. Let's listen again with new ears to this familiar reading. When Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. The virgin's name was Mary. When the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I haven't had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come over you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the one who is to be born will be holy. He will be called God's Son. Look, even in her old age, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son. This woman was labeled unable to conceive, and now she's six months pregnant. Nothing is impossible for God. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. Then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now I'll be up front here. I have never had a, a visit from an angel. I mean, not a bodily visit anyway. Maybe I've been visited, but I've never like had a conversation with an angel. Um, if you had, I truly want to hear about it because it is unusual and it's awesome. But I haven't. Um, I've also never been pregnant before. So I've got to be upfront about those things. So there are certain things in Mary's story that I absolutely don't identify with. But I kind of sort of somehow feel like I get where Mary's coming from in, in this particular reading. And this is what I mean. There are so many times in my life where all that I could say was, how can this be? Like on May the 12th, 2005, when I was standing in the Princeton Seminary Chapel and standing next to me was a woman named Summer Fulmer, and the pastor, Deb Bibbler, some of you know her, looked at Summer and said, do you take this man to be your husband? And you know what? She said yes! She said yes, and it surprised me a little then, but over ten years later, she stayed married to me, and that shocks me. So how can this be? Every day I get to be married to her. You've seen her, you've talked to her, you know I don't deserve her, but nonetheless it happens. And maybe more than any other moment of my life, when three years after that moment, I stood by Summer's side as our firstborn child came into the world, and he sat on the bale of hay and stared at the floor and sang Christmas carols just a second ago. It was, it was awesome. I mean, it's just one of those moments. He came into the world and... I heard his first cries, and they wrapped him up and put him on Summer's chest, and I absolutely just wept. I mean, uncontrollable tears of joy. I didn't know what to expect, and it just, 
I mean, I stood there heaving. I mean, the nurses were putting their arms around me. It's okay. I know it's okay. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. But how can this be? How can this be? Have you ever had those moments? I mean, those moments that are so good, those times that are so amazing that, that you're at a loss. You have nothing to say. You're just experiencing it, and, and you can only sit back and say, how can this be? I mean, your dreams come true. Those moments where you know you don't deserve it and you could never earn it, it's just there. And it's so amazing. How can this be? Of course, it happens in reverse, too. Uh, you get the test results back and the cancer has spread. Or the prognosis is bad. Or you get the news that you have lost a loved one suddenly. Now, how can this be? I just had lunch with him yesterday. Your, your nightmare scenario comes true. Or how about when there is another mass shooting? Another one. Another one of these acts of ridiculous, awful violence and death. How can this be? How can this keep happening? And all of these emotions, the good and the bad, doesn't it seem like at Christmas time you feel things more intensely than you do any other time of the year? Maybe it's because we're busy and stressed out and everything is more amplified, I don't know. But whether you're happy or you're sad, it seems like at Christmas time you feel it more. It's either lighter or it's heavier, wherever you're coming from. I wonder what Mary would say if we could talk to her about that conversation with Gabriel. Because it seems like in that moment, she's experiencing the highs and the lows that all of us feel, but they're all wrapped up in that one moment. Because on the one hand, she says, that the God of the universe is honoring me? My son is going to be the Messiah, the son of God? But I'm poor, I'm a nobody, and God chose me? How can this be? Praise the Lord! But then, I'm going to be pregnant, and I'm not married. I'm going to be an outcast in my own society. There's no way Joseph's going to marry me now. How will I even survive, let alone take care of this child? And how does anybody raise the Son of God? How can this be? I mean, her whole world was being turned upside down, and it seemed like she didn't have much of a say in it, did it? This is going to happen. But how much was going on behind the scenes that she didn't know? Other than what Gabriel told her about Elizabeth, she had no clue all the things that God was working together at the same time. While Gabriel spoke to Mary in Nazareth, Caesar Augustus was planning a census in Rome. And, and while Caesar planned the census, shepherds tended their flocks on a hillside outside of a little town called Bethlehem. And an angel was appearing to Joseph, to Joseph to tell him that Mary's child was from God and not to divorce Mary. And a group of astrologers called Magi were studying the stars and noticing some interesting things that were happening in the West. God was at work. God was moving in all these places and in all these people to save the world through his son, the Messiah Jesus. But all Mary knew was what Gabriel had just told her. All she knew was what was right in front of her, what she was experiencing. And isn't it the same for us today? I mean, God is at work in this world. That's what we say. We believe that God's at work everywhere. God's finishing his plan to rescue all creation and bring it back together again. But all any of us can see is what's happening right in front of our own faces. All we can see is what's going on in this one tiny speck of the world that we inhabit. And when you can't see the big picture, it can be difficult to know how to move forward, how to take the next step in a life and in a world that legitimately feels crazy at times. So how can this be? How can such great things come into our lives that we could never deserve or earn? And how can we move forward in the face of the awful, unexplainable things that sometimes come into our lives? That's really the question that Mary asked Gabriel. How did this great thing happen, or how would it happen? And then, how can I move forward with all the terrible things that could happen as a result of it? She could only see her own circumstances, but 
Gabriel knew the whole story. And when she asked him that question, here's what he said. Nothing is impossible for God. Gabriel didn't, didn't lay down for the whole plan and, and tell her in detail where God was working in every single place. And this is how it's all going to come together. It's going to work out just like this. going to be no room at the end or whatever, but it's going to be fine. And it didn't give her her five-year plan or anything like this said one sentence that made all the difference. Nothing is impossible for God. And he gave her that answer, and she responded, maybe the, the craziest words of just, okay, I'm going to do this thing, that are, are anywhere in the Bible. I am the Lord's servant. Let it be done with me as you have said. Mary could not see the whole story. But she could believe that God was in control. Nothing was impossible for her God. And so she could move forward and take on her role in God's story, confident that she was safe and secure in the care of the one who was working all things together to save the world. None of us here this morning, nobody can see the whole story. We can't. We're human. But we can do what Mary did. We can believe that God is in control. Nothing was impossible for Mary's God then, and nothing is impossible for your God today. Nothing. Nothing. You can move forward and take on your part in God's story, confident that you are safe and secure in the care of the one who is even now working all things together to save the world. This Christmas... May you believe that nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with your God. And may you invite the Holy Spirit to work through you to do amazing things in your life and in this world. Amen.